Day two of the Warriors over the Wasatch Air Show, just about ready to get underway. I'm Dan Hawkins. Good morning. I'm Matt Gepper from KSL Channel 5. Uh, it's great to be here. We'll be hosting this thing for you today. What a, what a privilege, what a fun day it's going to be. We had a lot of fun yesterday. The Thunderbirds, the headliner act, and this great event returning to Hill Air Force Base after a four-year hiatus and, and really comes during the Air Force's celebration of our 75th anniversary, the theme being Innovate, Accelerate, and Thrive, the Air Force at 75. And so we did have some problems, people getting on base yesterday. We want to let you know, knives, pocket knives, those kinds of things seem to be a little bit of a problem. Yeah, Team Hill, proud and happy to have you as our guest. We'll do everything to make your visit safe and enjoyable. Every effort will be made to minimize delays in entering and leaving the event. Please make sure you check the prohibited uh, items. There, graphic here. We ask for your cooperation in keeping dangerous items outside of the installation. All bags will be quickly inspected and all individuals are subject to search prior to entering the base and the Air Force gates. Adhering to this list of prohibited and permitted items will help ensure you have a hassle-free and safe experience here at the air show. Yeah, so make sure you plan your trip out here. A lot of people out at the air show yesterday. And so we want to give you a quick video on how to get out here to the air show. Excited. We get phone calls and emails daily. Expect heavy traffic around the base. If you don't have to be on the roads near Hill Air Force Base or on I-15, then then stay away. But if you're coming to the show, just be prepared for some traffic. The best way to go? Ride front runner to the Clearfield Station. A shuttle takes you to the flight line. Well, UTA is the answer. As far as getting to the air show, we've got a $5 special all day pass. You'll find that deal on the UTA Go Ride app. And we're going to have trains every 30 minutes. So we're increasing the frequency and we're increasing the frequency of the shuttles. So every 15 minutes for the shuttles, so, why fight the traffic? Why fight the congestion? Trains will run 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. We're not, not going to make anybody wait very long. We'll get people back here to the Clearfield Station from the entrance to the base, and it'll be really a seamless thing. You can also park at the Clearfield Station, Northridge High School, or Weber State University Davis campus and take a shuttle. You'll hop on a shuttle and you get right to the air show gate, so limited walking and you'll be right there. If you plan to drive on base, that opens at 8 a.m. The public can enter via Westgate or Roy Gate, but they cannot enter in Southgate. Also, do not park on the side of the road or interstate to watch the show. Parking on, on the side of the road is probably not a good idea with the influx of traffic that we're expecting. Do not come late. You want to be here for the whole day. So again, we hope you consider taking the front runner trains and shuttle buses. Great job by the Utah Transit Authority running uh, yesterday and obviously today to find out more information on this service. Please make sure you log in to the link at the bottom of our screen. Hill Air Force Base has been a great weekend. Hey, we have a great weekend lined up for you. The Air Force Thunderbirds, the F-35 demo team, a P-51 Mustang, and tons of aerial and ground displays will be on hand. There will be static ground displays of numerous military and civilian aircraft to include the C-17 Globemaster 3, the C-5 Galaxy, the Channel 5 News Chopper, nice. and more. <laughs> that, we do some aero, air, uh, acrobatics with that. In addition <laughs> to those fantastic displays and events, the Warriors over Wasatch Air Show will also bring you STEM City. STEM City will be an exciting display of hands-on booths to encourage children and educate parents on opportunities in the areas of science, technology, engineering, and math. Yeah, so lots to see and do, and now we are absolutely delighted to bring in Colonel Jeff Holland, the new commander of the 75th Air Base Wing, and he is really the mayor, if you will, of Hill Air Force Base, responsible for 50-plus tenant units, including the uh, Ogden Air Logistics Complex, the 388th Fighter Wing, which flies all the F-35s you see, and tons of other units located here at Hill. How are you, sir? Well, Dan and Matt, I'm excited to be here. Day two is going to be fantastic, just like day one. Uh, welcome to Utah. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, you're, you're new to command here, relatively new to command. Here. Yeah, new to command. So this is day five for me here at Hill. Uh, we are uh, very excited to be here. I went to college in Colorado. My wife's from Colorado, so we just flip sides of the Rockies, or avid skiers. So I uh, already have passes for snow basin and the epic pass. Can't <laughs> wait for the winter, uh, but we're enjoying the summer as we get it now. 
Yeah, and I can't think of a better way in all reality to take command. You get such an opportunity here to meet the community. How has that been, and and why is this air show so important to the community? Yeah, this is a great way to meet a lot of the community and get them all out at once. And so this air show is really about volunteers and the way that we interact with the community. So we have 1,500 airmen from Keem Hill, uh, but we also have 200 volunteers, uh, law enforcement, fire, medical, emergency, special services, all from the area. Uh, and it really helps show how important the relationship between our communities are, both the base and the local communities. What does it take to uh, coordinate with the local community? What does it take to put a show like this on? So this really is a culmination of about 18 months of really hard work. So, I mean, two days, 18 months to get there. And so uh, it takes a, a lot of effort, a lot of talent, and it and actually takes a, actually a lot of money. And so it's really the partnerships and the sponsorships that go with the Utah Airshow Foundation that really make this possible. And so again, that tie between the base and the community, just it's a great way for us to show how much we appreciate the community support every day. Okay, so and, and I know you've only been here a few days, so you haven't had a chance to get spoiled by watching the F-35s fly outside your window every day, but what was your favorite thing yesterday as you got around and met people and, and saw all the acts? Like, uh, you're, we're still aviation enthusiasts at heart. What, what was the fun of yesterday for you? So really the fun for me is seeing the excitement in the crowd. Uh, and so I was out there talking to folks, uh, and we saw people from California, Idaho, Wyoming, uh, had some folks... Uh, Arizona, and they're all excited to be here. And so uh, everyone who made it to the show yesterday had a great show, and we're excited to have them. Yeah, so great stuff. And wait, I... Speaking of... <laughs> that's like when you live in Leighton, that's what they, they say. It's the sound of freedom every, uh, every couple of minutes out here. It's great. Yeah, <laughs> so it's... Really glad that you stopped by. I know you're a very busy man, so we definitely appreciate it. And, uh, you know, good luck on your uh, command tour here at Hill. Oh, thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Welcome yeah. to you, Tusser. Thanks, Matt. All right. So our next guest is going to be Mr. Aaron Clark, and he is the director of the Hill Museum. But let's go ahead and take a look uh, and see what the museum is all about. I think this airplane is really cool. From these planes, these are bombs. History passes down. Was this one a bad guy one? Teaching Briley and her brothers and cousins what came before them. And it was used in the 1950s. And how these mammoth machines. I just like how it's made. Came to be. I just think it's really cool to see it like up close. The word engaging is what we're always looking for to, to get students interested in STEM. Allison Sturgeon, STEM program manager at Hill Air Force Base, explains how science, technology, engineering, and math is a huge focus for the Hill Aerospace Museum. And I think it's really cool. Families can check out STEM City at the air show, a huge hands-on display of booths and activities at the base and museum. 35 different companies or organizations come bring STEM exhibits. And our highlight is the NASA rover. So we're going to have a full-scale model of Perseverance, as well as wind tunnels and tornado simulators, robotics, all kinds of activities. Seeing these planes in action or on display is... I think it's really cool. As Briley would say. But learning the technology and engineering behind them? This is where a lot of people started. Inspiring. If someone like me wanted to be like a person who wanted to like build airplanes and stuff, they, um, I could like know how they worked and how they flew and how the engine worked. It helps if they have a why. Why should I learn math? Why should I learn science? And if they can come and see those things in action, I think it's really beneficial. Passing down history. It was the first one ever made. While bringing up the future. <laughs> Lauren Steinbrecher, <laughs> KSL 5 News. Welcome, Mr. Aaron Clark, the director of the Aerospace Museum. Let's uh, jump right into it. What is it what, what is it about Utah that uh, this is the place for an aerospace museum and, and an Air Force base? Well, yeah, uh, it all kind of started right before World War II began. Uh, the government was looking for places to put bases uh, to support the pending war, right? And so they looked at this place, and it provided the perfect location for an airfield. Uh, first and foremost, we're on a plateau. Uh, that's right by the Weber Canyon. And so aircraft used to fly below the weather and they fly through that canyon into this area. So it provided a perfect kind of route to this area. Not only that, we have a railroad in Ogden that can help transport supplies. Um, and in addition to that, we had 
uh, a fantastic workforce that surrounded this area that could support any type of mission that was here. Coupled with that, we had a lot of state leaders who advocated, <laughs> and they got several thousand acres and said to the, the government, hey, uh, we have these several thousand of acres we'd like to you know, give you for cheap if you build, build an airfield here. So that's kind of how all transpired at the beginning of World War II. Wow. Well, well, you're the consumer reporter, so that's right up your alley. That is right up, that's, that's right up my alley, yeah. <laughs> so can you speak a little bit to Hill's impact on national defense, really, oh, over the last yeah, 75 yeah. years? Obviously, the Air Force, it's 75th anniversary year, but Hill has played a major role. Yeah, it's really cool to think about how diverse the missions of Hill Air Force Base have been over the past 80 years. I mean, we ship munitions across the globe to our uh, the commanders. We do test and training, the Utah test and training range. We do a lot of things, but I think what's most important, and, we, and it's really cool to focus on for the 75th anniversary of the Air Force, is uh, the primary mission of Hill Air Force Base for over the past 75 years has been depot maintenance. Do you guys know what that is, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, well, they work on a lot of airplanes and put them back in service. Yeah, we fix we fix yeah. weapon systems. So <laughs> yeah. from aircraft to software to components to landing gear, uh, the primary mission of Hill Air Force Base for over the past 80 years has been fixing weapon systems, and that's what we do here. And those weapon systems go to support war fighters across the world. I, I know you were in conjunction uh, in Tooele. There's the, a, a depot out there that I know deals with a lot of munitions. Do you guys yeah. work with them, or are you sort of, because you're separate branches, they're Army, I believe. They're Army, yeah. So it just depends on the mission. Um, actually, half of Hill Air Force Base used to be uh, a munitions depot uh, at the onset of World War II. And then after the war, we combined into one because uh, the Air Force was growing. And that's what happened there. He was called the Ogden Arsenal. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, was it as loud in here in Ogden as it was, uh, was it, or here in uh, Layton as it was out there? Was it what? Sorry, as, was it as loud as loud planes fly over us? Was oh. it as loud uh, we, uh, blowing up stuff? And uh, oh, they weren't blowing up stuff; they were making bombs. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, that that was, that's that's right. too close that's to the right. flight line. <laughs> no, that's right. Go. That's most. So where, where can people uh, go to learn more? I mean, this is some pretty fascinating stuff. I mean, you can't sleep on Hill history. No, no, it's at, that's why we have a museum here called the Hill Aerospace Museum because the mission of Hill Air Force Base has been so impactful and so diverse over the past 80 years. They can come to the Hill Aerospace Museum and see over 84 aircraft and a bunch of other items that depict the impact of Hill Air Force Base and Utah Aviation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> speaking, Just when you said they were blowing impact. things up. <laughs> <laughs> From across the globe. So, yeah, the museum, it's free. We're open, uh, you know, Tuesday through Saturday. Uh, come and learn more about the Utah Aviation and uh, Hill Air Force Base history. Uh, it is a cool museum. I've been there. It's a, you you awesome. do a great That's job. Like it. a cool and, and what are the hours? Yeah, we're open from 9 to 4, Tuesday through Saturday. Okay, so thanks for joining us, giving us a thanks little snippet. Me. But, hey, we, we want to leave the crowd wanting more, so they got to come to the museum. <laughs> come to the museum. Check it out. All right, so that's going to wrap up our pre-show. But as you can see on the screen, the excitement has already started here at the Warriors over the Wasatch Air and Space Show, day two. So check out the uh, air show website. You can check out Hill Air Force Base Facebook. Tons of acts on the KSL 5 TV app and, and watch the live stream all day long. And and Matt, when you uh, start talking about some pyrotechnics and, and the planes flying, now it's starting to feel like an air show. I mean, it is really kicking off here. This is fun. I mean, as you just kind of uh, watch what's going on uh, behind us here is look at this guy coming in here. I mean, just an incredible... I'm stunned. I'm out of words. Look at the way he just... I thought he was coming in. That was crazy. I mean, he's just... Uh, the, 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 uh, the aerobatics uh, of, of all of this is, is really something to see. It's, uh, uh, this is uh, my first air show, if I'm being totally honest with you, where I've, I've seen this stuff in, in real life, and I, I, I can't believe I've missed it till now because this is truly incredible being out here. Yeah, and so, again, the act's starting to go up, and... and Pretty, I guess not shockingly, the crowd has started to file in and the cameras and the eyes are already skyward. So uh, lots to see and we got a full lineup, tons of great guests for you here today. Dan Hawkins alongside Matt Gephardt from KSL 5, the NBC affiliate in Salt Lake City. And we are now absolutely delighted to bring in our next guest, Mr. Kevin Ireland from the Utah Airshow Foundation. And 
Kevin has played a significant role for over a decade in planning uh, the air shows out here at Hill. Very familiar, obviously, with the ins and outs, uh, how the air shows uh, benefit not only the local community from an economic perspective, but the recruiting aspect of air shows as well. So day two, Kevin, we had you on yesterday. Obviously, I know putting on the actual event can be stressful so how you feeling <laughs> not too bad although i didn't eat anything until about seven o'clock last night so <laughs> but it's all good it was a great day we had a huge crowd much larger than we were anticipating and we were anticipating a lot of folks i was just thrilled and everybody we spoke to just loved it and had a great time uh, it's got to be a bit of a relief, right? I mean, if, if it's anything like doing television news, right? You work all day, yep. and then you get those couple of minutes on air. These are your two days to shine. You're shining, man. This is awesome. <laughs> Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. You know, we had some great dignitaries here yesterday. The governor was out. Uh, just had a great time. You know, Senator Mike Lee was out. Uh, we, we just had several folks out visiting, and they, everybody just really enjoyed it. And the crowds were just cheering all day. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I just imagined you talked about the crowd was larger than you anticipated and I'm looking out outside our broadcast position and I'm like, that seems really full already. And I just imagine that guy out at the gate with a clicker, right? <laughs> yesterday. And, and is that guy tired? Yes. He's got to be tired. The, tur the turnstile's gear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I wish we could click him in. There's just too many people and it's too fast. So, But we have ways to measure it and we've been measuring it uh, every hour or so. We take photos and look at the grid and that's kind of how we get our guesstimation on where we're at and what we're doing. So it's been awesome. So is there any, any guesstimates you'd like to share on day one attendance? My, my feel was about 300 yesterday. My goodness. That, that's incredible. I mean, that transitions into this is not... This is not an this is not an Air Force event. It's an Air Force event, but this really is a community event. Oh, absolutely! It's it's all about the community. It's the Air Force saying, "Come in and let us show you what we do," and it's for the community. You're exactly right, and that's what we wanted. And we knew after the COVID spell that there was going to be a lot of interest, and it was gigantic. We're expecting the same thing today. Yeah, and you mentioned the visitors from out of state coming a long ways just to come to this air show. What kind of impact uh, does having this show here at Hill uh, have on the surrounding communities economically? Well, it's gigantic. As we talked yesterday, I mean, you know, we fill hotels. People come and stay here for three or four days. They go down and visit the Big Five after they do the air show that's free. So it impacts the state greatly over a week or so because they're buying food, they're visiting the dinosaur park or lagoon, and as well as the big national parks, and they come out to the air show as well. well you know, I have I have people in California that call and say, "What are your dates?" Because we plan our vacation around your dates. Wow, wow. Um, well, uh, when KSL asked me to do this, uh, asked if I was available to do this, my first answer was yes, please. Uh, and, and, and then my second thing I said was. Listen, I'd like it a lot, but here's what I know about airplanes. That one's red and noisy. Uh, <laughs> as somebody who can speak with a certain amount of authority, uh, uh, what, what can folks who come out today or are watching here expect to see? Oh, yeah. We, we have all things to see from World War II aircraft all the way up to the modern F-35s. We have P-51s, F-18s, F-15s, uh, L-39s, all military aircraft at some place in time, as well as what we call affectionately flip-floppers and those are the guys you were just seeing so bill stein and rob holland uh our local guy uh brad worson from logan uh they're the ones that go up and do all the fun stuff and flip over and and do the flat spin so we have everything for everybody and let's not forget about the fire truck uh or or the, the jet truck right. excuse me which you'll see here shortly this morning with a little teaser, which will really light up your morning. Yeah, if I remember correctly, we had, we were considering changing our broadcast location. <laughs> yeah. uh, and one of our cameramen actually said, uh, I was fighting the fight or flight syndrome uh, <laughs> on whether I should bail out uh, of my broadcast position. But he, but like a good airman, he stayed. He stayed. So That's great, how it should be. Great job, Sergeant Harris. But, um, you know, with all the airplanes, yesterday I, I saw the... The Yak 55, I guess they call it the Yak 110. I, I was curious, are, is there just one pilot in there, or are there There's actually just, two? Yes, Jeff Borbin designed that airplane with a buddy of his. Uh, you know, the the theory is it was at a bar on a napkin, but I won't, I won't <laughs> hold to that. But they came up with this idea. Uh, Jeff used to fly the Jack Lynx biplane. It was called the Sasquatch. And it was a prop plane that they had mounted a jet to. And he said, well, why don't we take two planes and put them together with two props and a jet underneath it? 
and they built it and made it work, and it is the most incredible airplane you've ever seen in the sky. They're, the the paint schemes are completely different, yet they're stuck together. When he's coming at you, it's just a normal prop sound, and then he kicks it on the jet and does one of these, and you're like, that's impossible. But that's what it is. Yeah. And those are the things we love about air shows. It was so cool. It was like the Yak 55. Oh, let's just call it the Yak 110. You know, 55 <laughs> times 2. It makes that's a lot of sense. Exactly. Well, it also fits on a bar napkin. What, <laughs> yeah, 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 right? exactly. <laughs> what is it about Hill? What is it uh, about this show and Hill Air Force Base in particular that, that brings brings out 300, you say, approximately yeah, yesterday? Yeah, it, no, it's, it's a couple things. And here comes the truck that we talked about. Uh, it's a couple things. One is we're centrally located in the west, so we can pull from an eight-state area because we're, we're easy to get to. And then secondly, we've built this up over the years, and people have come to expect a bigger and better show, and we hire the best pilots we can get, and we've built a reputation. And that's really what makes the, the draw. People know what we're going to have. They want to come see the best, and it's easy to get here. Yeah, and speaking of shockwave, uh, yep, there, there you it go. goes. <laughs> and just so you know, that's three jet engines, 36,000 pounds of force. Yeah, yeah. We'll get some wings on that thing. Let's go. This is an Air Force <laughs> Base. Trust me, it would take off if you put wings on it. That thing is something else. And Chris is a great driver and has a great time with it. Yeah, and then apparently... World record of like 370. Yeah, he his dad's been in the business for many, many years. Oh, man. Uh, you've been doing this for a while now. Yeah. What are some of your favorite acts? Oh, I have several. I mean, it goes every year. It changes a little bit because the acts change. But, yeah, right. You know, I do like the Yak 110. Uh, yeah. Bill Stein and Rob Holland are very good friends. I love the F-35. Uh, it's just such an incredible aircraft that we get to see fly here. And, air force base. and then... Quiet. We're trying to do TV. Quiet. <laughs> and then... And then God... <laughs> Makes you smile and laugh. So, I mean, I just love it all. The history lesson of it is, I mean, there's a, just coming out to this show, there's all kinds of cool new aircraft doing stuff oh, there, and what have there, you. But there's, there's, there's so a history much. lesson just in sitting on the tarmac here. Oh, no question, no question. You get to see everything, like I said, from train L-39s. Uh, you know, we have the Vampire, which is a Canadian fighter plane. And we have somebody that's flying here, Jerry Conley, great guy. Uh, you know, then we got the F-18 sitting right out here that we all saw in the movie a couple weeks ago. So it's just a great cross if you don't like airplanes, there's still a ton of other things to do. We've got STEM City, we've got food, we've got entertainment. It's just a great day, and it's all free. Yeah, and you mentioned STEM City, and we're going to talk to Allison Sturgeon here. Just There's a ton to do when you're not looking at the sky. Absolutely, and that's the idea, is to build an event, a production that you can come and enjoy everything. It's not just about the planes. Yeah, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit... It is. Take a deep breath. That's yeah. not fog. No, it's, a potent smog. it's a potent fog. <laughs> but, but, you know, isn't that the beauty of, of this air show? And I'm sure this is why you do it. I mean, you, I would think it's the bringing the community oh, to, it's the kids. to share this. It's the kids. You know, the Air Force is all, they do air shows one for one reason is for recruiting. And we all know that. But it's also to let the veterans that are out here history yeah. and come as they say and show them what happens out here at Hill Air Force Base. Are, are there touching moments? You mentioned the kids, you mentioned veterans. Uh, as you've been doing this as long as you have, are there touching moments? Every air show. <laughs> Every air show. We had, recru we had brand new recruits put their hand up and say they wanted to join the Air Force yesterday. Doesn't get any better than that. Because that's what this is about. So, yeah.
Yeah, and so I guess I guess the last thing for you is really like I think you better enjoy today because I feel like you're going to be very busy tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, very much so. And we crank it back up for the next two years and 24. Look out, here we come. Well, because I think a lot of people don't know air shows really go on that two-year cycle. You can't just put an air show together. Not one of this size. There, there's some smaller venues that can do a every year show, but this size. It takes two years to plan and put all this together. Welcome back. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thanks Good for to see you, out. Matt. Yep. So, Kevin Ireland, the uh, Utah Air Show Foundation director, a huge, huge reason why this air show exists, and uh, team at Hill uh, really thank, thank thanks you. him for his partnership. So, lots to see as Matt, you get a great look at the crowd already starting to file in we got the 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 heat up here in the booth some pyrotechnics <laughs> yes we do we've had some <laughs> airplanes in the air the crowd is is rocking and rolling already i mean i mean i don't know how long it's been since you've been at hill but how you feeling i'm, I'm feeling great i'm currently looking at this thing which uh, as, as i aforementioned I, I wish i was more of an aviator i feel uh, i recognize that one from sonic the hedgehog <laughs> but uh but I mean, what these planes are able to do, the maneuvers they're able to pull in the air, it's a lot different than the 757 most of us have the experience of going in, you know? Yeah, and so we we're really lucky to talk to Kevin Ireland and, and him and his team do a lot of work with the Hill team to put this air show together. And so now uh, we talked about stem city so joining us now miss allison sturgeon an electrical engineer who's worked here at hill for several years in support of outreach for k-12 through stem programs and and you've really supported uh thousands really of events um, with tens of thousands of volunteer hours just amazing to reach thousands of students over the area so allison welcome back you were with us yesterday day two how was the crowd at stem city yesterday Oh, the crowd was great. Huge. Just just what we expected, and, and this morning it started even earlier, so we're, we're in great shape. Uh, the the uh, uh, joke, the, the insult of, of children is, oh, well, you're not a rocket scientist. You guys are rocket scientists. That's what you guys are doing out here. <laughs> well, there are some that are. I won't claim that, but there are some, yes. Uh, what is it about science, technology, engineering, and math that goes hand-in-hand hand with... Uh, 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 branch of the military. Okay. Well, the Air Force is very technological in everything that we do. As you can imagine, what it takes for those planes to fly, yeah. it's pretty remarkable. The brand new F-35 that we get to work on right here, we had the first squadron, which is all very exciting, has has hundreds and hundreds of people working on it continually with, with the software, which is a huge part of that plane. Right. And They're so computers. We need, yeah, they I mean, are computer with wings. Is yeah. what what we nickname it. So we have you know hundreds of people doing software, and then of course there's always a, lots of electronics. And me being an electrical engineer, I, I love that part of it. So just the capability of that plane and and everything that we do. We work on satellites and and, and like you said, rockets and all the planes here, and even old think what you consider an old plane. We're constantly updating it and. And there's great software on all of those things. So we need lots of kids to hopefully get excited <laughs> about STEM and see what a great career a STEM career can be. And yesterday we had Brigadier General Richard Gibbs, the commander at the okay. Air Logistics Complex, Don Jessen as well from the ALC. And, you know, they talked about, uh, Don in specific, talked about how uh, they're always looking to bring on, um, you know, STEM-specific type jobs like, you know, software engineer, those kind of jobs that you talked about. And so can you kind of talk about how what you do here at Hill Air Force Base kind of feeds into what the mission here at Hill demands, uh, you know, and ultimately what the Air Force needs to fly, fight, and win? Yeah, so we're, we're the early recruiting piece, I guess, so to speak, but we're just trying to get as many kids as we can interested because there's just a natural decline in, in how many kids actually go into a STEM career, but we work, we work really hard to let them know the fun part of it and then what they can do for the Air Force or even for our contractors that support the Air Force, all of that's important. And so we're trying to support science fairs and robotics teams going in to give career presentations. St um, hands-on STEM demos, getting, we do lots of tours, bringing students here. 
we have a very large program called Starbase, where we bring students in at fifth grade, which is a really pivotal year, where they're going to start kind of deciding what they're going to do once they get to junior high and high school. So we bring them in. They get five full school days to be on base. They get all kinds of hands-on wow. activities. We give them a tour, and then they get to meet you know, see what a real engineer and scientist looks like, that we're not that strange. <laughs> and they can see that, <laughs> see that it, it really could be a great career. Then we have another program called Legacy that is a, an actual true STEM pipeline. So we start students at age 11. They come back every year, and we keep them all the way through college graduation in a STEM career. And they get to work on base for eight weeks, get get real world experience, real hands-on experience. And we're we're just, they're really excited to come back year after year. In fact, we had 100% of our students from last year come back this year. So that just tells us that I guess what we're doing is working. If I'm a middle schooler or a high schooler and I want to be you one day, uh, what, what class do I pay extra attention in? Physics? Calculus? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 electrical engineering. I don't know if they have electrical engineering yeah, classes. No, well, but. <laughs> there are there are a lot of schools now that do have some engineering classes. The opportunities now compared to when I went to school are just off the charts. There's so many concurrent enrollment classes so that students can take and get college credit. But yeah, get those math classes, physics, chemistry, any of that stuff that you can get under your belt. There's there's lots of computer science classes now as well in high school. And what I love is I tell them. Go take it, try it. You might like it. You know, don't say no before you've tried it because you don't know what you don't know. And so it's really important to at least get the, the flavor of what it is before you say no. Yeah. So I'm curious, like, you know, you mentioned the fifth graders and they come out to the base and, and spend really a whole week out here. Um, but what are the skill sets that that uh, that they're really amazed, like, is is there some aha moments during those weeks? I'm just curious, like, you know, I, my son's a seventh grader, and, and he had a, 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 it was kind of a similar experience. And I remember him coming home every day, and he just had, like, these, these aha moments. Like, he was, he, you could see, like, all of a sudden, like, Guess oh, what I I'm saw interested. today, yeah. yeah. So I'm just curious, like, you know, what are some things through your programs that, that you, you can see the light go yes. on? Yes. Well, one thing that's really fun is we talk about the three principles that Newton, Newton physics and they get to actually do it and see it. Force equals mass times acceleration. It's not just this ex this little thing on the board. They actually put it into practice, and they get to shoot balls of different mass and see, do kinds of experiments on their acceleration, and we shoot rockets, and they get to do robotics. I'd say those are probably some of the, the favorites. And then another one is they, they do an egg, and instead of the traditional egg drop, egg drop, we actually put it on a space shuttle, and they're flying it. They're, they have to do a crash landing, and they get all these constraints and things that they can try to build something to keep their egg from breaking. So those, and we go through the engineering design process. There's eight steps of the engineering design process that they go through to to design this constraint for their egg, and. And that's definitely one of the favorite ones. The crashing part so, sounds easy enough. Yes, that part <laughs> the, is. Keeping the egg intact maybe maybe the tough. You mentioned there's fewer kids. Uh, you've seen a decline in maybe uh, uh, engineering STEM type skills uh, in in uh, or interest in it. Um, is there anything? Are there silver linings? Is there anything that leads you to inspire the night today? Oh, I yes, definitely. There are a lot of the programs that I've worked on for years found a way to be virtual. So I do a lot of work with Junior Achievement, for, for one thing, that, that's very active in Utah. And they, on the fly, really quickly came up with a, a virtual career fair. And in reality, now that reaches the entire state of Utah, where before their fair would only pretty much hit the Wasatch Front. So it's been wonderful that we, there, a lot of good things have come out, but uh, we found ways to do things virtually that now can reach the entire state rather than just local. So there have been some great things come out of it. When you say entire state, I mean, are, one of the things I've noticed in my job with things like being able to Zoom interviews, right, uh, yes. is now all of a sudden, if the expert's in D.C., I don't need to hop on an airplane yes. and fly to D.C. Are you now a national program? Well, 
Not, not really. Yet. Not yet. <laughs> but <laughs> if I was more than one person doing my job, <laughs> I'm always telling my supervisor, I could keep 10 people busy with yeah. what I could do and what I want to do. But it is just pretty much me getting everything organized. So if we can, we just try to keep what we've, we've got going. But it would be great if we could do that. But I do interface with the, uh, the Air Force STEM program is located out of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. And so we're, we're very integrated. We get resources from them. We learn from each other with the, the 40 other bases that are doing something similar and and so in that way we are we're definitely a national program yeah so last question before we let you go how how can people learn more about some of your programs if they want to get involved well tell your teachers because <laughs> we go out <laughs> and support teachers mostly so if the teachers contact the public affairs at Hill Air Force Space they can get that information to me and we can come out and support your your schools that's that's probably our biggest thing that we do Awesome. And so we have STEM City happening all so day long. So, so you guys will be here all day long. So if you're coming so. out to the air show, take the kiddos. You got some AC, I, we I, do. I've been told. And, and where are you located? We are on the north end of the flight line in Fire Station 1. It's got big bay doors. It's, it's easy to spot. We've got a few exhibits outside as well. But, yeah, don't forget to come see the Mars rover for sure. All right. Well, Allison, thank you so much for your time, and we really appreciate what you do uh, for the community and here at Hill. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at what you might be able to see at STEM City if you stop by today. Okay. I think we're just going to keep it. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Planes. These are bombs. History passes down. Was this one a bad guy one? Teaching Briley and her brothers and cousins what came before them. And it was used in the 1950s. And how these mammoth machines. I just like how it's made. Came to be. I just think it's really cool to see it like up close. The word engaging is what we're always looking for to, to get students interested in STEM. Allison Sturgeon, STEM program manager at Hill Air Force Base, explains how science, technology, engineering, and math is a huge focus for the Hill Aerospace Museum. And I think it's really cool. Families can check out STEM City at the air show, a huge hands-on display of booths and activities at the base and museum. 35 different companies or organizations come bring STEM exhibits and our highlight is the NASA rover. So we're going to have a full-scale model of Perseverance, as well as wind tunnels and tornado simulators, robotics, all kinds of activities. Seeing these planes in action or on display is... I think it's really cool. As Briley would say, but learning the technology and engineering behind them... This is where a lot of people started. Inspiring. If someone like me wanted to be like a person who wanted to like build airplanes and stuff, they, um, I could like know how they worked and how they flew and how the engine worked. It helps if they have a why. Why should I learn math? Why should I learn science? And if they can come and see those things in action, I think it's really beneficial. Passing down history. It was the first one ever made. While bringing up the future. <laughs> Lauren Steinbrecher, KSL 5 News. All right, now this is pretty cool. New to STEM City's lineup this year is NASA's Roving with Perseverance exhibit. It features full-size model of the agency's Mars Perseverance rover and history-making Ingenuity helicopter. Perseverance is currently collecting and storing Martian rock samples for a potential return to Earth for further, further analysis. Here to talk more about that is Mr. Brian Clement with NASA, a NASA engineer. Welcome, sir. Thanks. Welcome, to, to, uh, welcome to Utah. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, how, tell me a little bit about your exhibit. So we have the Mars Perseverance rover model in the exhibit, and we also have a model of the Ingenuity helicopter. And so the, the Perseverance rover uh, is currently, as you said, collecting samples on Mars in a place we call Jezero Crater. And uh, we're collecting those samples for eventual potential return to uh, here on Earth so that we can apply the full suite of our scientific capabilities and really understand what's in those samples from a perspective of habitability, uh, signs of life and understanding the history of our solar system uh, and Mars specifically. Well, so I, I got to ask, I mean, 
That sounds really cool, but I'm curious. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you ended up, uh, you know, you know, working out things about Mars. Right. Driving around a car on Mars. <laughs> yeah. How, how did I find the best job I've ever had? Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, it seems pretty cool. It is. Uh, I, I feel really lucky, first of all. Um, so by training, I am a, an environmental microbiologist, and I work in the space uh, called planetary protection. So my full title is the Mars Sample Return Program planetary protection systems engineer. There'll be a test on that later. I was like, if there's one thing the government's good at, it's long titles. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, where my expertise comes in is that uh, when we go out to other uh, planets, we want to make sure that our spacecraft are clean and we don't deliver the things we're trying to detect. It would make no sense to detect uh, Earth life on another planet. Oh. Right? So we want to protect our science capabilities. And when we return samples, we also want to make sure that we're, we're safely containing everything. And, uh, absolutely certain that that uh, what is in there is what we're we're analyzing. So what came from Mars is what we're analyzing. That sounds complicated. How do you do that? I, I, you know, I, I would think anything on the outside, I would think, as a layman, would burn off as I go through the atmosphere. Having seen enough movies about things burning off in the atmosphere, uh, but what, what it's, but it sounds complicated. The Mars Sample Return Program that Perseverance is really the first step in. So Perseverance is the first step in what we call the Mars Sample Return Campaign. And Perseverance is sampling at uh, Jezero Crater in the Delta, where we think, you know, right now we're in the Delta, where we think we have some really interesting samples uh, to collect. And those samples, up to 30 of them, will come back in tubes like this. So we'll, we'll bring like 30 of these, these tubes back in this very complicated scheme where we put the samples into orbit, we collect them in orbit around Mars, bring them back to Earth, and then the large spacecraft that brings them back to Earth will drop off a small spacecraft that will come through the atmosphere and experience the high heat of reentry. But the samples themselves will be in a container within a container inside that spacecraft, so they'll be well protected. That doesn't sound complicated. No, not at all. <laughs> look, look, can I ask, is this a, am I allowed to touch this? Am yeah, I contaminating absolutely. it? So, so uh, and I don't know if we're able to get back to that two shot here, but so this tube, how does, how does this go into the, the surface of Mars, I presume, mm -hmm. or the atmosphere? So, so what that is is, is a, a tube that gets installed in the drill bit, and the drill bit is a coring drill bit. I see. And so you see how it's, it's open on one end there. Yeah. And that allows the, the core to enter the tube as the drill bit is proceeding down into the, the rock that it's drilling into. I see. So Mars. this hooks there, and then it, it, it drills down and just... Yeah, somehow it'll seal off on the bottom. So the sample size is only, is that, is that big? Yeah, it's roughly the size of a Sharpie marker. What are you able to do with that? We're able to do a lot. So when we bring the samples back to Earth, we're really going to be able to apply the full suite of our scientific capabilities. And as science has progressed, you know, since, since the last time we brought back samples from a, from a distant place, which was first done from the moon, um, we've advanced science to where you only need a few grains of rock, really, to make tremendous discoveries. And so the miniature size of the of the samples is actually a benefit because we can get a diverse set of samples and bring them all the way back here. I'll hand this back to you. We have sure. a full we have a full shot on you. Uh, <laughs> there's a uh, what have you discovered so far? What do you hope? Better question. Predict the future. Use your crystal ball. I know you're a scientist. So you don't not supposed to guess, but use your crystal ball. When this one comes back, what are you going to learn? Do you think? I think we'll learn a, a tremendous amount about the the, the organic material that we've been detecting. Yeah. Um, you know, organics are like the, the, essentially the building blocks of life. And we know that we've seen organics come back on meteorites from Mars. So yeah. Mars, when Mars gets hit with something, it throws things into space and, and some of those arrive here on Earth as meteorites. And so we've seen the organics. Now we want to get a sample that comes from a place that we know. So we've carefully curated, collected these samples. We'll learn a lot about what really makes up those organics in their natural habitat on Mars. All right, so I wanted to switch gears because I, I saw in, in the intro for you that uh, it talks about the Ingenuity helicopter. I want to know a little bit more. How did it make history? Oh, Ingenuity made history by being the first spacecraft to perform powered flight on another planet. And Ingenuity is a tremendous technology demonstration mission. Uh, it was really designed to, to demonstrate a capability, teach us about how to perform powered flight. And it's become uh, just a sensation in terms of providing information to us. We recently uh, collected a series of pictures that help inform us for future Mars missions because we were able to take pictures of the parachute and the, the back shell or the part of the capsule that the, the Perseverance rover landed um, or came through the atmosphere in. And 
you know, you yourself, you can go online at, at, and look at those those pictures. They're tremendous. It, it just changes everything, being able to fly over something, take a picture. You can guide the rover. You can learn something about something you don't want to approach too closely with the rover. Uh, it, it's a really novel and, and uh, game-changing capability, I think, for, for the future. Well, tell, so bringing it back to the air show here at Hill Air Force Base going on for the rest of the day, uh, if I come out, you, you have demonstrations of some of these things. What, what can somebody hope to experience? Oh, well, they can come by and they can take a look at the rover. Most people that come by and look at the rover, they see it for the first time. They go, it's, it's so big. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, 2,200 pounds. It's a big vehicle. Um, put it, uh, 2,200, put that in, in terms of uh, my, my minivan. Uh, it, <laughs> that's about... Depending on the minivan, about one third of your minivan, okay. one third to one half of your minivan in size, it takes a lot of work to land something that big on, on Mars. Yeah. Um, and then we've also got the Ingenuity helicopter model, so you can see that too and understand, wow, how small it is, how light it is, um, and then how big the blades are, because Mars atmosphere is only one percent of ours, so there's yeah. just not that yeah. much to work with there, right? You really got to beat the ground, <laughs> beat the air, <laughs> or beat the air rather, but yeah, yeah. Oh well. We really appreciate you stopping by. So you guys will be at Stim City all day long? All day long. People can come by. Uh, we've got a ton of NASA stickers out there to, to give out. And, and there's a, a bunch of us that can answer a bunch of questions and, and uh, share in everybody's excitement with and, the and Mars the, rover. You mentioned a website, but uh, where can uh, people go to find out a little bit more about these projects? Yeah, you can find all of the, all of the information I'm talking about at mars.nasa.gov. And remember that all the pictures we take come down, and they're in the public record. And so you can go, you can spend days and days uh, looking at all the neat things that we've done out there. All right. Well, Brian Clement from NASA talking about Mars Perseverance rover. We really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks all for right. having us. So, pretty cool stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, way cool. I'm geeking out here a little bit. Uh, so, uh, as you can see here, the crowd is absolutely filling in here at Hill Air Force Base. It's uh, it's cool. It's breezy. It's a lovely day out here. If you were out here yesterday, you were sweltering. Uh, today, it's uh, it's going to get sweltering, but it's not quite that sweltering just yet. Uh, it's it's lovely on the tarmac here, as as we've seen a couple of really kind of amazing demonstrations at this point of uh, of what airplanes, unlike the commercial ones we're all used to flying on, can actually do. Yeah. So. Uh Tons to see and do. Get out to STEM City. This event is free to the public. I think we really haven't mentioned that, but I think that's important to it know. Is. I mean, you Utah get a lot. It's a, it get some bang for your buck. Listen, as a Utah, Utah's favorite four-letter word, free. <laughs> we all we love free. Yeah, come on out. It's, it's it's an amazing show. And speaking of things that airplanes can do, uh, uh, <laughs> that they're not not supposed to do, sir. Uh, let's wake up Major Jake. If, help me with your last name, if you would please, it's, sir. Impelazeri. I go by Primo, so that's probably the easiest way. We'll yeah. go with Primo. Primo, Primo. Yeah. That, I can, Primo. that I can pronounce. All right, let's yeah. go with Primo. <laughs> so the Thunderbirds, based out of Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada, the headline act here at the Warriors over the Wasatch Air Show. The Thunderbirds perform for people all around the world, displaying the pride, precision, and professionalism of the United States Air Force at air shows, flyovers. They're really exciting and inspiring crowds and showcasing the elite skills that every pilot has to possess and obviously you demonstrate the incredible capabilities of the Air Force's multi-role fighter, the F-16 Fighting Falcon. So, Primo, Sir. number eight, tell us what you do for the Thunderbirds. Yeah, Dan, so I'm the advanced pilot and narrator, uh, which is honestly the greatest position, best number on the team, uh, but I'm biased, so. <laughs> uh, but what I do, so I'm the advanced pilot. What that means is usually the team deploys on a Thursday. Uh, I will deploy with my crew chief, on Wednesday, so he'll be fine with me in the back seat. Uh, we will arrive, and between myself and him, I do all the air show coordination, all the air show setup, and I get the airfield ready for the team's arrival on uh, Thursday. And then uh, during the actual show, I'm the hype man, so you get to hear me on the mic. Uh, so I'm the narrator from the show. I get to control people's emotions with the, uh, with the show, and it's awesome. And then outside of that, the best part of the job is I get to do the hometown hero flights. So myself and Thunderbird 7, who you talked to yesterday, uh, we get to do those flights, which are absolutely incredible. So I believe you guys flew a couple Olympians the other day. Is that correct? We did. So Justin and Ashley, Justin Schoenfield and uh, Ashley Caldwell, uh, we actually met them out in Indy. And they're uh, the gold medalists out in China for the last uh, Winter Olympics aerial freestyle uh, skiing event. And... They killed it. They're just incredible human beings. What they do on a day-to-day -day basis kind of mirrors what we do. You know, both professional, both high-performing people, and we had a blast. 
High stress, I would imagine, too. Uh, it's, it's, what is it like to fly one of these airplanes? Uh, it's the greatest feeling in the world. Uh, I grew up always wanting to fly. You know, my dad uh, was in the Air Force for about 10 years. He flew C-130s. And then uh, he's been in aviation his whole life, too. He uh, just retired from Delta. Uh, so I've been around aviation, which got me into wanting to be in the military, wanting to fly. The military is honestly the best flying you could do uh, in the world. And then flying the F-16 right behind us, uh, again, biased, but the greatest fighter jet the Air Force has to offer. Uh, we fly the Block 52s, so it's a uh, Pratt & Whitney motor. Big engine. Big engine, 29,000 <laughs> pounds of thrust. Uh, so you can see how small the F-16 is with that big motor. Uh, we can pretty much accelerate going straight up. If you guys are NASCAR fans or Indy fans, that's more thrust than the entire Daytona 500 combined. Uh, and one of those F-16s. Just wow. one. Just wow. one. So a little stronger than my, my minivan. Just a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> couple more horsepower. That's right. Just a couple That's more. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about uh, the show itself and what uh, – Folks who either are going to watch online or hopefully are coming on out yeah. to, the, to the base to see in person. What are they going to see today? And can you tell us a little bit about what's behind it? Yeah, so uh, we fly at 3.30 today. Uh, so please come on out. Uh, we're excited to see everybody. Yesterday we had an incredible turnout. But the last time we were here was in 2018. And a lot has changed uh, since 2018. So uh, 2020, we took that year. Uh, obviously, all the air shows were canceled for COVID. We were doing the America Strong mission, uh, so flying over all the hospitals, giving back to the, uh, to the hardworking men and women of the hospitals. But we took that year and redesigned our entire show. So uh, between working with our team members, uh, working with uh, some people in Disney, uh, we mirrored the show off of... If you think about a Disney kind of firework display, uh, we kind of mirrored it off that. So the show has a purpose. It's a, there's a theme to the show. Uh, it tells a story between the whole about 36 minutes um, between the music, the narration, and the actual maneuvers. So if you haven't seen us since 2018, you're in for a surprise. We added a, a couple more sneak passes, so keep your head on the swivel. I think you uh, – I, I, all I saw was just the buzz in the crowd yesterday. I can't remember. There was, it was one of the two passes, but it was like a noticeable – the entire crowd just changed its demeanor. It was really awesome to see. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know – the show starts off with a bang, uh, so we start off, you know, high intensity music with the clover loop opener. Uh, then we bring people down a little bit. We have some false finales, and then we end it with the big old grand finale. So uh, we're super excited to be here. Very cool. Obviously, it takes a, a team to pull off your mission. Talk a little bit about the makeup of the team, some of the unique aspects of your team. Absolutely. So we have about 140 of the greatest enlisted members in your United States Air Force. 140. How many? 140. How, uh, all pilots or? Nope. So we have 12 officers on the team. Uh, one through eight are pilots, and then uh, seven through 12 are what we call support officers. Okay. Um, and within those 12 officers, they're in charge of the 140 enlisted members uh, on the team. And the team spans between 28 different AFSCs, so 28 different career fields make up the Thunderbirds. So you can think of us essentially as a mini wing at Nellis Air Force Base, with number one being the commander leader of the team. And obviously, you know, one of the big buzzes right now in the Air Force, and, and uh, it's really, you know, to accelerate change, but we talk about multi-capable airmen. You guys are like the epitome of the multi-capable airmen, it seems. We are. So everybody on the team, nobody does just one job. Everybody does everybody else's job, and you have to do that when we're deploying. So this year, we're at 32 separate show sites. We have 69 shows. Uh, it's our 69th year of the Thunderbirds. So... Picking up and moving the team of 70 people every week, uh, each individual person has to do more than just their job description. And, you know, the Air Force talks about the ACE concept, and the Thunderbirds epitomize the ACE concept uh, within the Air Force and really the military as a whole. What's the coolest thing about flying? Fly, yeah. What is the coolest thing about flying a Thunderbird? Um, you know, I grew up, I remember going to the air shows as a kid, so yeah. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. The Dayton air shows, big air show. Every other year, it'd either be the Thunderbirds, Blue Angels, uh, just on and off. Uh, it's awesome being able to represent uh, not only this brand, you know, yeah. the uh, Thunderbirds, but also this brand. So being able to be the ambassador in blue, represent America, being able to showcase the pride, precision, and professionalism uh, of not only the Air Force, not only the Thunderbirds, but the United States as a whole. It's just awesome being an ambassador. 
yeah, Air Force's ambassadors in blue. But I got to imagine being in such a elite organization and obviously, you know, the best of the best from around the Air Force. You guys got some, like, secret cool handshakes or, <laughs> you know, I, I see the, the party it looks like when the, the planes are taken off. That's right. I mean, you can generally see the passion that you guys all have for what you do, and, and it's beautiful. But, like, seriously, you got a secret handshake? Like, can you can you give us a little demo or something? We have fun. So every pilot, if you, if you see them taxiing out, every pilot uh, develops, we call it the gang sign. So every pilot develops their gang <laughs> sign with their crew chief. So... Each pilot has a DCC and an ADCC that are in charge of, you know, essentially, you see how good those jets look out there. It's the hard work of the maintainers on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and, yeah, I got one. So uh, mine starts out with the eight load. So, you know, it starts out like that, and then I chop everything. And then so I used to be in Japan. So I was the Pac F 16 demo pilot uh, out in Japan. So I got to give a bow to all my, uh, you okay. know. Okay. All right. Uh, all my Japanese fans, and I uh, just traveled around the Pacific, and then, you know, to the Delta Burst. So me and Matt have some life goals today. We're going to come right. up with, like, a, a secret PA handshake. That's, I don't know. We're gonna, that sounds we'll a lot easier than learning learn to fly a Thunderbird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Handshake we can figure out. We'll figure that out. <laughs> but, you know, we'll, we'll close out on this. You know, obviously air shows, you know, inspire the next generation of airmen and guardians. It's an air and space show, but... Um, you know, how important is that for the Air Force, uh, that mission for you guys? You know, our mission, Recruit, Retain, Inspire, um, the inspiration piece is really why we do what we do. Uh, you know, we like to, you'll hear Thunderbird 1 say this all the time, and the team is stands for a beacon of excellence, and the name of service is something greater than yourself. And that's what we try to present everywhere we go throughout the country, and really the world. And... Uh, if we could just get, you know, if just one person in this crowd inspires to be greater or to give back to service something greater than themselves, than themselves, then, you know, we've accomplished our mission. It only takes one person. And then that one person will do something great. And then people see it. It's infectious. Well, Primo, we certainly appreciate your time. I know you're a busy man. you got yes, a lot to prepare for. Big headline act, the Thunderbirds. You see some more aircraft in the sky. Looks like an F-22 and an A-10. But let's learn a little bit more. I know it's not the F-16, but let's look at this F-22 package. day the wind's starting to die down it's actually oh, it's pretty nice, nice out here yeah. Matt it's and getting there yeah how cool a job does Primo have like really like I it's... mean he doesn't get to sit here and talk into a no, microphone no, you and me, but no it's, it's not it, as cool it's okay yeah it's okay <laughs> I mean but you know really cool you could see the the love of aviation uh, that these guys have and they're just so good you see the a10 Thunderbolt 2 I think they call that the army's best friend it's a uh, a, a position to ground to support but let's go ahead and pitch to the air boss and learn more eventually it also became a great dogfight aircraft in fact the highest scoring ace in the european theater was francis gabby gobreski from oil city pennsylvania of the many aircraft that he flew he did get aerial victories in the p-47 thunderbolt roman numeral one so in the tradition, Fairchild Republic, Long Island, New York, they renamed the aircraft and gave it a Roman numeral two, based on the great history. We see that in a number of aircraft, including the F-35, a lightning Roman numeral two, paying tribute to the piston-powered propeller-driven aircraft of World War II. And an airshow buddy by the name of Buzz Lynch as the uh, F-22 gives you a little profile of photo up and no. Up 
up against the Wasatch Mountains, up into the blue. These are the weather days that we long for each and every weekend. Now, in its environment, low to your left, it is the HM Thunderbolt 2. Single pilot environment, the pilot sits in what they call a titanium bathtub. Flying low is its environment. A lucky shot from an enemy rifleman on the ground can ruin the pilot's day. So they close the pilot, his avionics, all of his vital equipment in that titanium bathtub to protect the pilot. One of the vertical rudders could be shot away and get the pilot home. One of the engines could be destroyed and shot away and shut down, and the other engine will get the pilot home. In fact, an actual story in, air to, in the combat arena, one of the A-10 pilots did take a hit from a ground-based artillery, shot out the rudder and one of the engines. That pilot went to manual reversion and flew the airplane back to the base in the Middle East with one engine and one rudder. The aircraft was repaired. Several days later, was back out in combat. That pilot had a call sign given to the pilot at the squadron when they all started out as young lieutenants. Call sign was KC. Turned out that that meant killer chick. Yes, it was a female pilot. She has since retired from the Air Force. She is out on the speaking tour now, telling about the exploits in the A-10 Thunderbolt suit. Yeah. A great testament to the designers, builders. A-10 versus A-9 competition was hands down going to be the winner of the A-10 for many different reasons, including the fact that the airplane sits high off the ground. When you're loading those hard points underneath the belly and the wings of the A-10 Thunderbolt 2, the installers can stand up underneath the wing. They can bring up the bombs and rockets and attach them to the bottom of the wing on a scissors device. They don't have to lay on their back beneath the wing in an uncomfortable posi position to attach those. That was even part of the reason the A-10 won the competition over the A-9. So both aircraft now have touched down it is a testament to the men and women of this facility here in Ogden who keep them flying, the folks on the ground and the folks in the air, each and every day. To all of you dedicated professionals, to all you great professionals, military people and civilian people, ladies and gentlemen, at this show, will you join me in giving them a big round of applause for keeping our nation safe, keeping our pilots safe in a very professional way. And understand this, we love you. Thank you so much. Now we took you into the world of training with the Watson brothers flying their twin yellow thunder aircraft, their Harvard aircraft in the air. Let's go again now to a Commonwealth country, the United Kingdom. You know, towards the end of World War II, jets were being introduced. The jet engine came out. It was quite unreliable. Quite often they exploded on an aircraft. They burned a lot of fuel. They were unreliable. But it was going to be the beginning of the jet era. So while the enemy had jets that devastated our allies in World War II, the United States before the end of the war, although it is only written in certain places, did have the Lockheed P-80 Shooting Star involved in World War II 
in Italy, it has been written by Robert Doerr, in a book called Fighting Hitler's Jets, an armed P-80 shooting star was on a mission and it was uh, kind of written by Robert Doerr that it was a clandestine series of missions. But the British were very busy as well. They were developing their first jet. And I've got to give credit to the British. They hit a home run. We'll tell you about that airplane, about the pilot who is flying that airplane. He is a civilian. As we look at the A-10 Thunderbolt II, sitting high off the ground with the twin rudders, twin engines on the back, and the V-tail F-22. Raptor. All right, low and to your left, Jerry Connolly's on the takeoff roll. He is sponsored by U of X. Great solutions for your 2020 transponder needs, ultimate aviation, Gulf Coast avionics, and Concord batteries. Now, low and to your left, look at the unusual design. If you remember the P-38 Lightning of World War II fame, it had a box tail. And you'll see that same type of tail coat, tail design that is what are you trying to say tail design on this airplane now it is a pure jet of the many things the british thought about and they thought about a lot of things is they used balsa wood and pressed plywood for the nose cone remember strategic metals were very much sought after during world war ii so they used wood where they could now the tail cone is aerodynamic. They wanted this to be a fast early jet. So they shaped it in the shape of an egg, which mother nature has made a perfect streamlined object. That's just the truth. So it is egg shaped. Now it could be a trainer, it could be a solo aircraft, could be a two place, could be an attack aircraft, could be an aircraft carrier aircraft, and a high altitude reconnaissance aircraft. In fact, it was all those things. So let's go back to the fact that it was 1945 when they started to fly the aircraft and the war was ending. But they knew we were going into the jet age. So several things they did well. I told you about the unreliable jet engines. This one has a Goblin engine and it has 3,500 pounds of thrust. What racers do when they race cars is to have a very short exhaust stack and that keeps the horsepower from being bled by exhaust pipes. So the tail cone of the jet engine is extremely short. Now you look at the box tail and you say, okay, now the jet blast from that jet engine, which is quite severe, is going to buffet that tail. Here's what the British did. They raised the tail. They gave it an angle from its angle point back to that box so that the jet blast did not touch any of the components of that box tail. That was another ingenious method. So they kept the horse, they kept the thrust up. They didn't waste thrust with the long tailpipe. They had the structure in the back. They had aerodynamics. It was light in weight because they used wood wherever they could, just as they did with their de Havilland Mosquito aircraft. All right, over our left shoulder, there is the design I want to tell you about. Introducing our pilot, Jerry the Jet Conley. He's from Crestview, Florida, a United States Air Force veteran, an aerospace engineer, 42 years of flying experience, typed in this jet and many other jet fighters. And you know about his sponsors, and you know this goes back to the early days of jets. Okay, Jerry Jet Connolly, high into your right. More about the aircraft.
Even though its design goes back to after World War II, 1945, there is a jet class of racing at the Reno National Championship Air Races held in Reno the second week of September every year. And in the jet class, an aircraft like this one, not this one, won the gold a couple of years. So it is still in competition with aircraft like the Iskra, like the L-29, like the L-39, and other straight-wing jet aircraft brought home the gold. Now let's go on the high-altitude aircraft, putting another set of larger wings on this aircraft. They broke a record in terms of altitude for aerial recon. In 1948, they flew one of these aircraft with the high altitude wings up and recorded a altitude of 59,000 feet of altitude. That was an amazing thing to do. They have a number of firsts with this aircraft. It was all right, we're back here at Broadcast Central. Dan Hawkins alongside Matt Gephardt from KSL 5, and we are absolutely delighted now to be joined by Major Kristen Callsign Beowulf, the commander and the F-35A Lightning uh, demonstration pilot. Ma'am, how are you? I'm great. How are you guys? Good, good. Great. So yesterday, picture-perfect conditions to fly and in front of a fabulous home crowd what you what you think of the crowd yesterday no that was awesome um just to walk through the people and see all the support um them to recognize you know us in our uniforms point out like hey that's our f-35 team um and just the support you know when we land and get out of the airplane everybody's excited to finally see us and get a front row seat for our performance so uh it was it was awesome we're lo looking forward to doing it today you know we're t we've talked a lot this morning about stem and you know the uh the importance of STEM to the Air Force, and I know that you're an engineering graduate. That's so right. can you tell us a little bit about your background and, and how STEM has played a major part in, in getting you to where you're at in this point of your uh, Air Force life? Sure. Um, I was always interested in math and science as a kid, so uh, being a chemical engineer in college kind of just came naturally, and it was a degree I actually enjoyed pursuing. Um, but, uh, I mean, the message we like to share is, you know, whatever your kids show an interest in as a young person, just foster that and get them excited about that, whether it's STEM, whether it's, you know, the arts, whatever. Um, you can be any degree and be a pilot in the Air Force, which is something cool that we try to tell people. Um, but absolutely, you know, the having that engineering background has helped, you know, just think critically and be a pilot uh, in the Air Force. So uh, I loved it. Yeah. What is it like? What is it like? To, the F-35, this is the, the newest, the best, the best, the greatest the Air Force has at, at this point. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. What is it like to fly it? Uh, I mean, it's super lucky, right? So uh, we talked about it yesterday. I fly these airplanes. These two out here will probably have less than 300 hours on them total. Uh, I mean, they came off the factory line, you know, less than two years ago, and they're years newer than my car. <laughs> uh, so you get in, and they're all just spick and span, really clean, um, you know, work phenomenally. So uh, I feel lucky to fly the newest and greatest one, but it means, like, the tactics, and when we take these things to combat, they perform uh, top, like, tip of the spear. You know, they're night, night one. This is who we're going to call on. So uh, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, yesterday we talked with Colonel Anderley. He's the 388th the Fighter Wing Commander. And, and one of the things that he talked about, and I think we might have touched on it yesterday, but we didn't really talk about it a lot. He said, you know, that you're an instructor pilot uh, when you're not in show season. So, you know, for those that, you know, probably see you in the sky and they think that's all you do, can you kind of maybe talk a little bit about what you actually do operationally for the Air Force? Yeah, um, so we're obviously out here at air shows and we travel around, and that's our full-time job on the demo team, uh, but it's a very, very small piece of what goes on at Hill Air Force Base. We've got 78 tails and about 100 pilots out here um, that are practicing combat skills, and, you know, even deployed today as we speak, we've got a squadron gone. So um, when we come back from a show, kind of regroup or have some time off, um, you know, I go teach young kids uh, how to be flight leads or instructors and uh, take them out there maybe on their first flight out here in Utah just to, you know, try to be, bring a piece of that mission to the combat combat mission uh, when we're not doing air shows. So uh, it's a huge machine, uh, but they do it really well. Uh, you hear a lot about Gs as a civilian, right? They, they, they talk to us a lot about Gs and the G forces. This one can do nine Gs. That's right. Uh, without putting me in it, please. <laughs> uh, what, is, what does that feel like? What, is that, what does that 
do to you? Uh, what kind of stress does that put you under? Yeah, uh, there's, I'm not going to lie. Like, 9G sucks. Uh, <laughs> no, matter, no matter what airplane you're in, it, it feels a little bit different. And, you know, we're wearing all the gear to try to help combat that. Uh, but, you know, it kind of becomes second nature once you've been in cockpits for 11 years now. So... Uh, the training is great, but 9Gs is 9Gs, and it's it's terrible. You know, you've got that five-pound helmet on that now weighs 45 pounds. You know, you can't move your arms. Uh, you've got all the stress on your upper shoulders and back. Um, but we're, you know, professionals in staying awake on the airplane. So, <laughs> uh, but, yeah, yeah, you probably would enjoy if you don't enjoy 3Gs on a roller coaster. You know, I think people might not, uh, and, and it kind of came up slightly yesterday too, but, like, what is your – post-performance routine because I, I imagine it's kind of like professional athletes they played a game last night and they got to prepare because you got to perform again at the exact same performance level today as you did yesterday so what do you do um, after a performance knowing like on a two-day air show that you got to fly again t- today yeah it's a marathon not a sprint right so we perform usually a rehearsal in two show days in a row if not sometimes we're going to about to go to Oshkosh which is over a week long um, and it's just fly every day, you know, uh, fly your butt off. So, uh, I mean, you, you definitely try to stay hydrated, eat well, work out if you can. Um, and then, but our post-flight routine is just to walk the line with the crowd, get to say hi to the people. And then we go back and talk to the maintainers of, hey, how did the jet do? Talk to my safety pilot, like, how do the maneuvers look like? We watch ground video to see, like, what you guys are seeing at show center might be very different than what I think I'm showing you guys. So uh, it's a lot of debrief and then just rest and relaxation and get ready for the next day. Yeah. Talk a bit about your team. What, what kind of team does it take to, to put on the demo? Yeah, uh, obviously everybody sees 15 minutes of the airplane and they think, oh, that's awesome, the pilot's amazing. Uh, but it's really, I have a team of 15 guys and girls behind me uh, that make this airplane fly, right? So 10 of those are maintainers. A variety of crew fields we have represented all by Hill Air Force Base, active duty airmen. So we've got crew chiefs who take care of the airplane, like think a basic car mechanic, but now we're working on fighter engines. Uh, we've got avionics that does all the computers and software and systems on the airplane. And then we've got weapons people who load bombs actually onto actual real airplanes. Um, and then we have aircrew flight equipment that takes care of all that survival gear that I talked about, my G-suit, my helmet, and that sort of stuff. So it takes hours of work beforehand, and they're here sometimes hours after I fly just to make sure that airplane is safe. Um, so they're a huge piece of the mission. You know, they're out there doing the – our job is recruiting, right, getting people excited to fill my shoes one day. So they're out there, you know, selling swag today for six hours just talking to the crowd. Um, so they're a huge piece of the mission. We couldn't do it without them. Yeah, and you talk about that, the interaction – with the crowd and really obviously showing the demonstration of the aircraft is 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 one aspect and making sure that the american population knows that we are ready to fly fight and win but recruiting the next generation of airmen and guardians uh is also a really important aspect of what you guys do yeah, I mean, that is our mission. Recruit, retain, inspire the next generation to fill my shoes. Um, and we're dealing with, you know, different generations react differently and are inspired by different things. So for us to get out there and be relatable, so we try to hire, we have, you know, a very diverse group of maintainers and airmen on the team just to say, hey, here's my story. It's not the same as her story. It's not the same as his story. Uh, but you can do any of these things in the Air Force. It doesn't have to be just be a pilot, you know. We've got you know, all these mechanics, uh, chefs, lawyers, doctors, you name it. Uh, so that's our goal is to go out there and spread that uh, to the people, not just the airplane flying. So, as I've uh, as a civilian hanging around, you know, living in the Air Space for the last twenty or so years, and, and, and being on various tarmacs and stuff, uh, one of the things that is striking about uh, uh, military is, is and, and the Air Force in particular, and the aircraft is the precision of it all. Uh, you you must be precise in the air, of course, for obvious reasons, but the precision of the crew to get you ready. I, I remember I went on a tour as a, a Boy Scout back in the days, and you know they were literally talking about, no, no, these rivets won't do because they stick out and there's drag, and that causes... And when you're going that fast and you're doing with that much precision, you, you can't have any anything imprecise. Uh, yeah. uh, talk about that if you would, please. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's the pilot side, right? And everything's very scripted, very you know altitude, airspeed, exact, and we debrief to, to uh, you know, nitpick it. Um, were you at show center? How did this maneuver look? Uh, but then the maintenance side as well, they have, you know, millimeters of precision that they have to adhere to. Even things, you know, I go out there and I say, no, this, this looks great. It's fine. And they're like, yeah. absolutely not. You're fine. <laughs> not flying that today. It's not safe. Um, so just to hear from their side, you know, they're subject matter experts on the actual airplane. You know, I'm trained to handle emergencies that happen uh, to an extent and bring the airplane home safely. But the way these guys can, you know, take apart a motor, take it out of the airplane, um, put it back in and unscrew a thousand rivets, like, 
that is just, you know, we're all precise in our very individual career fields, and that's what makes the military special, I think, working with, you know, experts in every single career field. And I think that could be a misnomer, right? Like, we've talked about STEM and, like, oh, it's important if I want to be an F-35 pilot. But, like, you know, the teams like the Thunderbirds and, and like, the F-35 demo team, I think the fact that STEM is such a big factor in even what our enlisted career fields do. I mean – and obviously, there's a lot more enlisted uh, in the military than officers. But can you maybe just, uh, you know, from a broad perspective, talk about, you know, the really important role that our airmen and NCOs play in making? Because you can't do what you do without them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like I said, there's one pilot on the team, and there's 15 other people, right? Um, and we take them on the road, and they're they're doing all the legwork in the in the back shop. So. Um, having those guys, and we put a lot of burden on them more than we used to. You know, we used to have very specific career fields and maintenance broken out, and that, that was all they did. Uh, versus now we're taking, like, whole concept airmen. We're teaching them almost everything on the airplane uh, to be able to, to fix and do on the road. Um, so there's a lot on their shoulders, and they are very good at, you know, abiding by the manuals and doing everything to a T to make sure that's safe. Um, but they are way more experts on the engineering side than I am on the airplane, even being an engineer myself. So uh, we rely on those skills to keep me safe in the air and honestly the whole fleet, um, especially when we're talking like combat systems, yeah. that's very different than what we're doing um, to keep those pilots alive when they're going to war. What's the coolest thing about the F-35A? Whew. Man, uh, I love, I mean, it's just the, the latest and greatest fighter. You know, you've got uh, to laugh like a one foot by two foot touch screen. That's the only display in the airplane. So it's like a Tesla. Yeah, I need a Tesla now. Like, I feel outdated. So, uh, one for gas prices and for yeah, the coolness go. factor. Um, it's just the latest and greatest airplane, and I, I think the cool part is we're you know about eleven partner nations right now have this airplane, and so to go talk to either the Italians, Australians, the Brits, and say like we're flying the same airplane, we can talk the same tactics, the same sensors, and fly the same formations next to each other, um, to know that they're t- uh, training to the same things, we're that much more lethal um, as a force, and to say hey we're all the same team here guys we're flying the same airplane and that's pretty cool yeah i'd find those same weapon systems and the interoperability it brings to our our combined partners around the world i mean absolutely critical to today's national uh, you know security environment it's as dynamic as it's ever been and and obviously the f-35 uh uh, probably one of the most visible symbols of that interoperability yeah absolutely so really cool stuff we know you're busy we know you got a lot of things on your plate so we for the second day in a row, you stopped by, so we really appreciate <laughs> yeah, that so much. But, uh, uh, you know, we'll leave you, you know, with this. Uh, you know, if if there's a young person watching this and they want to grow up and, and be you one day, what do they need to do? Uh, I just tell, you know, parents or kids, just get in a cockpit. You know, get airborne. Get some air under your feet and see how you like it. Um, you know, every flight's different. I didn't have a lot of flight time growing up, but I was exposed to that by dad being in the Air Force. So get some flight time. It's really expensive, but there are scholarships out there to be able to do it. Whether you're interested in general aviation, military aviation, there's so many paths these days. Uh, and it's an amazing, you know, opportunity to get into, whether it's an actual career or just a hobby. Yeah, they, the Air Force Recruiting Service has programs like Aim High Flight Academy. I mean, just a lot of different yeah, ways Silver now Air is a great one. to get flight hours. So, yeah, that's a great point. You probably learned on like a Cessna or something, right? A, 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 yeah. This is slightly different. I did like two flights in a Cessna and I went straight to military pilot training. Oh, there you so go. <laughs> it was hit the ground running. It's but, a little different. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look and learn a little bit more about Major Kristen Beowulf's F-35 demonstration team. <laughs> 